Like, I think the feeling is because of things like ChatGPT that there's no reason to go into something like computer science because you're just going to get in a thing and be automated right away for this kind of thing. I think that's the feeling. Okay. I wanted to hear your thoughts on it. Like, like, do you think it's a good time to be a roboticist? Or, absolutely. Uh, I think it's <laughs> a great time to be a roboticist. This is the probably the next 50 years are going to be like the heyday of robotics. Like, uh, Are humanoids the next big thing? How long before they take our jobs? To get some perspective on this, I talk with Agility Robotics CTO, Melanie Wise. Her answers will probably surprise you. I think you'll like this interview if you want to understand the current technology around humanoids, what's possible, and where the opportunities are. I also think you'll like it if you're curious about how LLMs like ChatGPT will impact robotics and jobs, or if you'd like to know about manufacturing in the U.S., especially the challenges and opportunities. As always, I'm Audro Nash. This is the Audro Nash Podcast. After you listen, I'd love to know on X or in the comments if you agree or disagree with Melanie's perspective on the timeline for humanoids and where we'll see them first. Also, if you want to talk about this interview or robotics in general, I host a weekly space on X on Thursdays at 9 p.m. Eastern Time or 6 p.m. Pacific Time. It's free and has been a lot of fun. All right, here's the interview. I hope you find this conversation as enjoyable and enlightening as I did. All right. Hi, Melanie. Would you introduce yourself? Hi, Adro. <laughs> I'm Melanie Wise, CTO of Agility Robotics. Now, last time we talked, you were at Fetch. Uh, tell me a bit about what's happened, like your path uh, for the last, I don't know, year and a half since we've done an interview. Yeah, sure. Um, well, the last time we talked, Fetch had just been acquired. I spent about a year and a half uh, working at Zebra Technologies. And then I decided to take some time off. So took about six months off, traveled the world. Um, that was a lot of fun. Went all over Asia Pacific, uh, went to Antarctica and then South America. And then I decided I should get back in the game. <laughs> and uh, I decided to go join Agility Robotics. Um, uh, would you give a little bit of background on Agility Robotics? So Agility Robotics is a mobile manipulation company. So uh, it has a humanoid-ish uh, form factor that is targeting uh, tote manipulation for machine-assisted operations. So uh, every time you order something or online, it potentially passed through a tote. Um, and Digit, our mobile manipulation robot, is one of the robots that might be handling a tote that has something you ordered in it, or even parts for a thing that you might buy. Oh, yeah. And so a tote, it's just a small bin? Is that what a tote is? Yeah, a tote is a plastic container that it can be, it can weigh, range in uh, sizes quite a bit. So it can be anything from like two feet by two feet to like, 10 inches by 10 inches or so the the range on on the size of the container is very large mm -hmm. okay and so you have digit digits a humanoid digit digit is helping with these tote related tasks and you mentioned it's humanoid ish can you tell me what it looks like yeah so digit uh, is probably about five feet two or three inches tall uh it has two uh, six degree of freedom arms as a head with LED lights uh, for her face. Um, and it has two legs. Uh, however, the leg architecture is a little bit reversed from the leg architecture that we have as people. Um, the, a lot of people would say the knees are backwards. However, because it has more of an avian leg structure, it's actually the ankles are backwards. Um, Oh, uh, so it's it's a little bit different um, from that perspective. Yeah, I think of it like having ostrich legs or something like that. Because when it kind of, and it's cool because I was imagining while watching it that it's kind of pragmatic to have the legs go backwards because then you can have it drop its 
height and keep the arms in front of it, but you don't have the knees occluding whatever the arms may want to get into. Yeah, the knees don't get in the way. And uh, it also biases the, the, the center of gravity to drop straight down, um, which is nice. It's got a nice squat. Hell yeah. Okay. And so how did you pick to come to agility? Tell me a bit about that decision. Yeah. Um, so when I, when I, you know, looked out in the robotic space, there were a lot of things that I was interested in. Um, I thought very briefly about starting my own company, uh, another one, and I decided I wanted a little bit of a break. <laughs> um, <laughs> and so I thought I'd take a less stressful role uh, as like a CTO, not a CEO, because that's a very stressful role. Um, and I spoke with a couple of different companies. Um, and the thing that really excited me about agility were, was a couple of things. One, it was very much in a market that was similar to Fetch. So I knew a lot of the customers. I knew a lot of the, the customer challenges um, and why people buy robots. Um, so it helped me really understand whether I believed that the product had a product market fit and whether people would even want to buy the thing. Two, Agility's product is relatively mature. Um, they have physical robots. They have been working with customers. I didn't want to start with a company that was still in the, does the technology even work, you know, past the first prototype stage. Um, and so that was another aspect of why I was very interested in joining Agility. And then the, the third thing was, is, you know, one of the one of the things I've always been interested in is mobile manipulation. I mean, at Fetch, we had a mobile manipulator. Um, but also, as we worked in the AMR market, it was very clear that there was there's a whole set of tasks that are better suited towards mobile manipulation and not just mobile. And I thought that that would be an interesting uh, direction to go. And if you're wondering why I didn't go and do more mobile, uh, well, I had a non-compete. So <laughs> I couldn't just go off and do another AMR company. That's very funny. How long does, I mean, I'm just curious about the non-competes. How long does that last? Is it like for five years you can't be in an AMR company? Yeah, so my non-compete, <clears throat> because I was a key person in a material transaction, as they call it, uh, my non-compete is three years from the date of acquisition. Gotcha. That's pretty interesting as a constraint for how to pick the next robotics company. Well, it it's it is a material constraint, you know. <laughs> yeah. For sure. Okay. So then because of this, I guess because of the constraint, then digit having legs makes it so that it's a different product in a sense, and so the non compete is not valid for this kind of thing. Yeah, because my non-compete was very specific to autonomous mobile robots, so AMRs, and didn't apply to other types of mobile manipulation technology. Uh-huh. Okay. And so I interviewed Jonathan Hurst a number of years ago, who is one of, is he one of the founders yeah, of, he's one of the founders. Agility? Yeah. And so he's a professor at Oregon State, right, who was deeply involved. Yeah one of the founders and everything. Um, and so when we talked, the agility robotics was really about the last my uh, last last hundred feet of delivery, yeah. this kind of thing. So like going from the FedEx truck to the um, curb, I guess, curb to doorstep or something. And I, I understand from talking with you earlier, um, I think at Roscon or some other time that it's... Um, pivoted just a little bit. Can you tell me kind of what yeah. market you guys are going into and also why not last little bit of delivery, this kind of thing? So like all startups, uh, our product intentions have evolved. Um, and when you look at last mile delivery or the last hundred feet of delivery, let's call it, there's a lot of uh, challenges that go beyond the robotics technology safety, compliance, weather. Um, 
many of the <laughs> many of the challenges that you see, even in the autonomous car market, Digit would have to face if it was going to do the last hundred feet. And you're seeing today that you know a lot of companies have been successful in indoor semi-structured environments. And before I even got to agility, they were already um, converging on product market fit and product alignment that was more geared towards indoor um, material handling. And since I joined, um, I've been working with the team to really get us focused down on a set of solutions that um, really play to Digit's strengths and are scalable and repeatable within our customer sites. And this is this is something that, you know, uh, many startups have done in the AMR space, Locus, Fetch, Automotors. We all ended up getting into kind of a set of repeatable workflows that our customers really were excited about. And we're doing the same thing at Agility. Hell yeah. And so that workflow for agility is the moving totes. Is that correct? Yeah. And there's tons of workflows in the warehouse that involve moving totes. Ah, hell yeah. And then, so, I mean, like just thinking about humanoids, um, why is a, like, so a thing that strikes me is that perhaps and I'd love to hear kind of the why uh, the why Digit is a very good fit for this, but like I imagine a humanoid is going to be more expensive than a robot with a wheeled base. Walking is a challenge, uh, probably limits the payload. Um, why a humanoid form factor for this kind of task? Why not just a mobile base with a big pinch, like like a two foot pinch gripper that could just grab the totes and move on? Yeah, so. As someone who spent a lot of time building mobile robots, one of the things that you'll find is there's a lot of companies, including Fetch and Automotors, who built base platforms and then got into the business of building lots of accessories, right? You can see that with Fetch, Geek Plus, Autom Automotors, um, and and even uh, um, Locus now with, with their acquisition of um, Waypoint, right? whatever. Um, but, but the thing is, is that, is that when you look at um, that, the accessories start to eat into the payload, right? So like when you add, so like if you look at a lot of autonomous mobile robots, right? Like everyone wants to put a hundred kilograms or more on top of these things, but every bit of shelving or cart or whatever you put on there reduces the payload that you can put on. And then the next thing is, is so say you want to put a hundred kilograms of, you know, e-commerce goods on there. Now it usually gets to some conveyor endpoint and they typically want you to push the tote off onto the conveyor. But now you have to build the conveyor, uh, you know, tool. And typically they want to put multi bins. And so now you need like multi-layer connect conveyors. And then you end up in this situation where you're building all of this mechanism to do these like really complicated things. And uh, all at the same time, you're trying to battle the other problem of having a small footprint because most warehouses are not meant to have, you know, 10 foot aisles. They're meant to have relatively narrow aisles because people are relatively narrow. And you're also fighting against stability. So as you put mass higher on a very small platform, it wants to tip a lot more. And so one of the nice things about legged or dynamically balancing systems is as you reach higher, you can do other things with your uh, stability platform to enable you to reach and pull weight from, you know, uh, kind of outstretched positions back into your footprint. And so one of the advantages of having a dynamically balancing system or a bipedal robot is you can have a relatively small footprint, you can reach relatively high, and you can carry a relatively competitive payload. 
Very cool. Yeah, it's an interesting... I guess the alternative of an AMR has a lot of trade-offs that you run into. And so a humanoid is very flexible in what it can do. You can change the dynamics. It's it's almost like these environments were made for people, which is very yeah. interesting. And so you can kind of leverage that. Yeah. What do you what do you think about that perspective where it's like one of the big benefits of a humanoid form factor is that the majority of the world and a lot of the infrastructure was built around people so the aisles in the warehouses are thin so that a people can a person can walk through not a big robot carry like with a huge footprint um what do you think of that idea yeah i mean that's just the reality of the world right like and the thing is is that it's very hard and costly to change over these these environments for the infrastructure right and our customers are very targeted at return on investment in under two years. And so remodeling an entire warehouse for a robot typically puts you in the five to 10 year return on investment time frame. But if you can drop a robot right in, your return on investment is pretty rapid. That's awesome. And so our, um, how does Digit compare to people in terms of speed? of doing tasks or this kind of thing or what's maybe it's not even a fair comparison but how do you think about that yeah so typically it's not about direct speed comparison it's about throughput comparison because what you'll see when people do tasks they do a lot of compound rapid tasks and then they wait around a lot of a lot of time (laughs) (laughs) they do um People are really good. So it's good like at, the tortoise and the hare yeah. kind of thing. So a person goes <laughs> and does like six things at once. Yeah. And then they just like take a 15 minute break kind of kind thing. Of. Whereas the robot can be doing like one every three minutes or yeah. something like that. Yeah. You find, you find if you go and watch the way people do a standard activity is it's very bursty um, where they have lots of like activity and then no activity. Um, uh-huh. And so what our so customers funny. really care about is total total activity over some time frame. The other thing that you see is is people take breaks, right? Like people over the course of a, an eight-hour day take at least one hour of breaks. And so that's a lot of time for a robot to catch up in as well um, in terms of total utilization and total throughput. What, uh, on the order of how does it compare? So if you consider a long period of hours, um, what, what are, I guess it, long enough so that the breaks and everything average out, what's kind of the ratio of throughput, uh, for digit versus say a human doing a similar role? Yeah. So we don't have, I would say a large enough data set to make any like claims on this direct claims on that. Um, do you have any any guesses like is it one to one is it yeah uh, one to two is i mean i would say that that as we continue to go into the field we are at parity or slightly better over the long run than than in the use cases we're deployed in so like Obviously, there are some high speed activities that Digit most likely will not be doing anytime soon. But in the use cases that our customers have us targeted at, we are at parity or slightly better. That's amazing. Hell yeah. And then how do you think of like while we're on the topic of people doing these jobs? Um, I, I So I, I hosted a a space on X. And so we talked a bit about this as kind of like about humanoids and like food for thought for this interview. Um, one of the concerns brought up was kind of the ethical one of having people moved, like basically replacing people in different jobs. And I brought up labor shortages and things like this, but I'd love to hear your perspective on kind of the ethics of robots, especially humanoid robots um, and kind of the complexities there. Yeah. So let, let's, let's separate some of the concerns. So let's start with just labor in general. So when I first started in this industry, the logistics and manufacturing industry, robotics 
uh, kind of focused in in the 2014 2016 time frame there were about 600,000 jobs available so and in that time uh, all of the robotics companies that you know and love have been deploying robots into that that environment mm-hmm. and as fast as they can probably yeah, as fast as they can i mean i i don't know if you've seen the latest numbers from amazon with their kiva fleet it's like seven hundred fifty thousand robots they've deployed yeah it's remarkable so so uh since then uh the labor the labor gap has grown to a million unfulfilled jobs so so we have been throwing robots at the problem as fast as we can and the labor shortage has grown by 400,000 jobs so that that's something to food for thought um however the the thing is 400,000 and since when did you say that that since 2014 2016 and today that's bonkers oh yeah, my goodness just look at the bureau of labor statistics I think it's the, is it the, the baby boomers retiring? Is that what, at one of the forces on this? It, it's the aging labor population. It's a, uh, lack of interest in the jobs. Um, it's a, uh, wage pressure problem, right? Um, and it's also just, you know, I, I'm one of them and you are one of them is our parents told us. That when we would grow up, yeah, we would grow up, we were going to be special flowers and go to college and do whatever our hopes and dreams were. And I don't know about you, but my none of my hopes and dreams were to work in a warehouse. <laughs> um, but uh, but that is... <laughs> what a way to put it. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, very true. That's one aspect of it. But I, I think, you know, on the flip side of it is as time approaches infinity and robots approach infinity we eventually are going to have to have a conversation about the nature of certain jobs and whether people do those jobs right the technology is continuing to prove that it can create more jobs like less than six months ago or nine months ago at this point nine months ago no one had ever heard of a prompt engineer and now it's like one of the the more random jobs out there for the kind of um, quote unquote artificial intelligence economy that we have. Um, so technology is creating jobs. The problem is, is whether the people who are currently doing these other jobs have the skill set, the training and the capability to move into these new, these new labor positions. And, the problem is, is that's a socio-political issue in large respect. There is some onus on robotics professionals to develop tools that are easier to use um, and that can be cross-trained from someone who's doing a warehousing job. But we've got a long way to go. I mean, most people struggle to use their iPhones and web browsers. And we're talking about like, Robots are basically iPhones and web browsers on steroids with legs <laughs> and arms and actuation. <laughs> and so although, although technology is going to continue to create more jobs, we have a problem of helping people transition into those jobs long term. And eventually the definition of work is going to change. And I, you know, this is a hard one for me because like from a from a personal perspective i believe in your universal basic income and i believe that the way we solve this problem is changing the way we view work and creating a social safety net and then creating a basis for everyone to be um you know live yeah to live and and if they want more they can earn more. Like we create an economy that allows for that. Um, and that, that, that doesn't preclude capitalism. It just, in, yeah, it enables a basis for living. It raises the bottom, yeah. but keeps, you can still be super ambitious. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
I don't I feel like that is such a complex issue and I don't I don't know where to go on it. Yeah. Uh, cuz I've heard size for everything. What do you think um so related to all the prompt engineers and stuff. Um I feel like um <laughs> like we all thought all the blue collar jobs were going to be automated and then here comes chat gpt and then it looks like a lot of the white collar jobs are going to be automated um how because and then that would be interesting because the people that are doing fairly sophisticated work it's like okay now go learn how to be a plumber and an electrician from a lawyer or something like this um there, there was a very funny south park on this a little bit ago um but what do you think about that? Like, what are your thoughts on this in general, all the AI and knowledge workers and automation in general? Yeah, I I think that it has come a long way. It's very interesting. Um, I think that there is a class of worker out there today that is going to struggle, specifically in the area of knowledge consolidation. And so that's where you're seeing a lot of the pain right now um, in in like, you know, you can go to ChatGPT and ask for basically a travel schedule, you know, that challenges travel agents. You can go ask for consolidation of legal law, you know, uh, like legal opinions for law arguments, right? And that's, in my mind, a lot of what ChatGPT is good at right now is consolidation of knowledge. And so any job that basically is that activity, yeah, there's a there's a problem. But what we are seeing is ChatGPT struggles with creative tasks, um, algorithmic tasks in some ways, ironically enough, um, or complex algorithmic tasks. Um, anything that needs uh, intuition or intuitive thought um, anything that needs specialized knowledge. And so it's, yeah, it's hollowing out the center, but I don't think that it is getting to the point where it um, is challenging the the specialized knowledge sets or anything that requires a human interface or reasoning contextually in this social framework, right? Like, a lot of like what lawyers and doctors and other people do is they're making decisions not only based on case law, but also the social context, the social framework, and the emotions of what is happening at the time. You know, can you imagine um, ChatGPT diagnosing you with cancer and just reading it out? Like, oh my god, you're right. That little prompt like, pops up and it, yeah, it's like congratulations, like sad face emoji. <laughs> yeah, you have cancer. Oops. Oh my uh, god. So I think that there, there is, there is, we're not there yet. It, we probably or might get there. It depends on how we evolve as a society and how comfortable we get with these kind of interactions. You can see some of that in some cultures that are more robot facing or more technology adopting. Um, but I, I think where we're seeing it right now in a lot of the pain is the consolidation of knowledge kind of work group where, yeah, if that's what your job is, yeah, ChatGPT can do it. it. It's basically a database searching tool. It is. And it just formats the information for you. I, I was reflecting on this recently and um the way the kind of conclusion or the i don't know the, the what the, what i arrived at was that i think it's it's there's like knowledge like how do you do stuff and there's what do i do and it's not very good at the what like if i'm solving a thorny programming problem it's not much help if i describe it to it and ask what can i do it's super generic advice but if I, like I'm having to use a new large framework at work um, and I don't know how to do things in it, but I can be like, I know exactly what I need to do. What should I do? And it tells me very well. So I'm getting up and running probably like 10 times faster than I would before this. So it's like knowledge is cheap, but like the intuition on how to proceed and understanding all the complexities or nuances of what you're doing. Um, and like common sense checking it seems to be 
Like there's a ways to go there, in my opinion. Well, and and it it also I think one of the other things is you have to make sure to check it right because it does story tell uh, and make up uh, information. Actually, one of the funnier things that um, my co-founders and I did was we asked it who founded Fetch Robotics, ChatGPT, and it didn't get it right at all. And we were wondering about this because two of my co-founders are very under the radar. They don't have much social media. They don't have much about themselves online. And it didn't even know who they were. So so it's it's one of these things where it has only the information that it has access to, right? And so it is still when when I say knowledge consolidation, that's what it's doing. It's consolidating the knowledge that's available and it has access to. Yeah, I think that's a big point. I really like that that way of phrasing it, knowledge consolidation. Let's see. Going back to digit do you um are there are you guys attempting to put an llm or anything on digit for like having it do i i don't know or i guess what's your what are, what do you think about llms and their use in robotics and are you guys interested in trying this at agility yeah so um yes we have an innovation group within agility um and we have done some pretty interesting demos with LLMs, um, largely showing how if you assume that Digit has a set of skills like walk, pick up, place, um, and you have that interface of, of skills, then you can start asking Digit from through a large language model to do arbitrary tasks, as long as they can be broken down into those composite skills. So um, very recently we did a demo day in San Francisco um, with a large group of uh, interested parties. And one of the things that we showed off was a large language model demo. And someone was like, take the box that is the color of Darth Vader's lightsaber (laughs) and put it on the uh, podium labeled uh, the same number as the movie number that Darth Vader appeared in for the first time. And it did it. And like... Like there's so much to impact there in so many ways. Like, and, but all of that basically, cause it basically digit was in a, like an environment with some boxes and some podiums that were numbered and labeled and they had colors and other iconography on them. And so the lit large language model basically unpacked that all into basic, uh, like an action tree you know, a behavior tree. And then using the skills that Digit had, it went and executed it. Mm-hmm. That's really, it's very interesting. And it's so funny that like now you can be like, you can give, you're trying to give your robot instructions and you program it with like a riddle yeah. and it has to solve it and this kind of thing. Like you can be like esoteric and yeah, whatever. It's so funny. Do you, um, what do you think about its impact like LLMs in robotics, do you think, do you think it's going to be like very useful for high level control or is it kind of a flash in the pan and we can do some neat demos with it? Or is it just like user interface changes where it's, you can talk to it and it's a bit easier to then do action selection from there. How how do you think it sits? I think we'll initially see it, you know, because one of the things that we are building at Agility is, is kind of this skill framework for Digit. So as we start doing more and more with our customers, probably the first place you'll see us potentially using these tools is for um, our customers to describe in natural language what they want the the robot to do from a from a workflow perspective. It's like I want you to move this tote from the put wall to the conveyor if you have a if the tote has an error i would like you to 
put it in the um, hospital, quote unquote, hospital area of the warehouse. But, you know, so it's super of, fast templating yeah. of actions effectively, like yeah, building a behavior tree. It, from... But you're, you're taking natural language of like someone who talks in business logic and making it easy for them to describe that without them having to know like specifically, okay, Digit has to walk over here and identify the tote. And then Digit has to grab the tote. Like all of that will be basically derived from the natural language description. Mm -hmm. That's super cool. Yeah. I, do you think that kind of thing I could see speeding up robotics adoption significantly? Because they... Because you don't have to have someone who's an expert in the field per se translate it into like an expert in manufacturing or um, logistics, go and take all the words, relate them to what it means, then program it in the robot. So you need someone who's good at both yeah. or can communicate with teams that do both. And so now it's like, oh, you just tell the robot and it does it and it translates it. That's yeah. very interesting. Yeah. Okay, so that's kind of the short term. Do you think like uh, eventually it's going to be a bunch of robots that are all using LLMs for high level control, and they'll just have like action sets that they can do, and um, you'll get the high level commands from the LLMs, and they'll just do it? Or what do you imagine? I'm I'm guessing that what you'll have is like a natural language description that you can say, and then you basically evolve it until it's what you want especially in manufacturing and logistics and then you say freeze and then run forever um because people want repeatable deterministic labor from their robots they they don't want every time you give it an instruction it runs the llm every time and is like well today i decided i'm gonna take a tour around the warehouse before i do this thing. yeah I'll move this box to over here every single time it has to decide it. This kind of thing. That'd be pretty silly. Okay. But you can consider, you could believe that that would be a normal thing in like a home robot, right? And so it's really a domain specific behavior and way of looking at the problem. It's just in our domain, we care about stability, determinism, repeatability, um, you know, throughput, reliability, all of those things. Yeah, for sure. Let's see. So going back to Digit, um, one thing that I saw that was very interesting on the website is you guys have recently opened like a, a robot factory, like a big humanoid robot factory. Will you tell me a bit about that? Yeah, so we've... We haven't opened it yet. We've kicked off construction of it. You know, it's it's opening in the spring. Um, so, uh, and that will be, you know, it's designed to produce long term uh, up to ten thousand robots in anticipation of of the the customer contracts that we currently have. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. And so, what? parts of the making the robot will be done there will it be a lot of assembly or will yeah, it be we guys okay where do you get the parts from otherwise like the the motors the sensors where where are they all coming from i guess it's a diverse set yeah it's of... a diverse set of suppliers and fabricators um in largely north america wow hell yeah is that um I guess that's that's probably by choice to have it mostly in North America. You know, we're making sure that we are choosing suppliers and vendors that are not in, I guess, conflicted geopolitical regions. Um, we're trying our best to do that. Uh, and we're trying to make sure that we have a good uh, diversity of suppliers so that we're not single sourced. Um but a lot of the North American focus is, is because our initial market is North America. And so, um, yeah. Very interesting. Do you, um, can you tell, I mean, we talked about it in, I think our last interview, um, about just like, there's actually a good amount of manufacturing here. One of the 
here in the US or in North America, uh, one of the things that another space, so I was talking to Fergs, and he was saying that the US is really good for, and if I, if I am mistaken or anything, I apologize in advance, but what I understood was the US is very good at very specialized, like high precision manufacturing. But when you get more to volume, it's tricky because um, it doesn't seem that there's that much of that. But what's your perspective on this? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that that is relatively true, um, I, except for in automotive. Um, I think if you if you look at it, it really comes down to the cost of of bringing the product back into the United States and in what volume, right? And in what kind of import tariffs and things like that that you might encounter it for very large high value goods. For smaller electronics, high value electronics, you know, things in the one five thousand dollar range. One of the things that we basically run into in the United States is just the labor pool. Like we're already talking about logistics and manufacturing, having a million open jobs right now in the United States, right? Can you imagine producing the iPhone in the United States? Like I, I saw like an estimate that you would have to basically build like a whole town with millions of people to support the iPhone production uh, in the United States. And so like one of the big reasons that actually precludes us from building certain things, especially at high volumes in the United States, is we just don't have the infrastructure and the people to do it, um, which is is different in other parts of the world. They actually have, like if you look at Shenzhen in, in China, like they produce so much there. And you could like walk down the street and go to like 14 injection molders in like the spirit, the like the span of like five city blocks, which is something you would never find in the United States potentially, um, and so there's just this contrast of of um, suppliers, the density of them, and the sheer amount of labor that's available to support some of that manufacturing. Yeah, where so where are most of your manufacturers in North America, like? Where in the U.S. are they in Mexico? Maybe some in Canada. Like, where where are you seeing most of them? So, well, I can't speak for all of that because that's not my like uh, job at at Agility. But we do use uh, several large North American machine shops and other vendors for making our our machine parts and things like that. And they're they're located in the United States. Gotcha. Um, do you like one thing that has been interesting is the U S I think is investing pretty significantly in like reshoring a lot of manufacturing. So I think there's like, I don't know, trillions of dollars or billions of dollars, like some huge amount of money, um, in flight. And that infrastructure is going to take, I don't know, 10 years or something to spin up. But how do you imagine this changing in say 10 years, 15 years? Um, if you have opinions on kind of what's what's been going on, I think that in order to achieve that, we have to reestablish our trade class as a country. Um, and I think that's that's something that a lot of people are working on, but I think that there are not strong incentives right now um, for people to go become tradesmen, uh, to become skilled electricians or skilled mold makers, uh, welders, welders. Yeah. Terms. Yeah. And so it, it kind of creates this vacuum. It, even if we wanted to reshore it all, could we reshore it all? Because we have tended towards, um, over the last 20 to 50 years, you know, towards a higher and higher, higher education population, um, that is trending away from trade based jobs, um, which leaves a gap for trying to reshore manufacturing in the United States. Yeah, it's such an interesting thing. So like I talked with 
um, on the SenseLink Act, Act podcast, I talked with like AMT, Association for Manufacturing Technology, and a few other manufacturing organizations. And some of the things that stuck out to me, it's like actually community college and uh, like community college is a wonderful way to get a trades education. And you can get like, so you train for six months or something fairly short and you immediately get a high paying job for that. Like not CEO high paying, but like enough to raise a family, probably a couple hundred, hundred thousand or more. Yeah. Because, because there's so few tradespeople, right. And they're trying more and more to get the word out. I know AMT is, I mean, they're really trying a three is, they're trying to pull more people into being, you know, robotic operators, for example. That's a very high paying job. But just getting young people interested in it, um, them seeing the value in it, um, and seeing it as a career path that is meaningful. Do you think so? A thing that I have been aware of is there's, and I don't, this doesn't, definitely doesn't speak for everyone, um, but I've been seeing a lot of people thinking universities are not a terribly good deal for this kind of thing. So it's like some people are saying things like, I won't have my kids go to college and whatever, because maybe trades and this kind of thing could be a good alternative. Um, and a lot of, a lot of people just end up getting a lot of debt. But, um, do you think that kind of society is going to start having, like, will we move back into a better balance with trades? Versus everyone goes to a four-year college with not as many exceptions and this kind of thing? I don't know. I doubt it, um, if I were to guess, because the United States, we have a very manifest destiny approach to life, right? Um, what does it mean? Of, well, if you have a desire, you should go get it, right? And so we raise our children and our cultural bias is towards achieving what passion. we want, mm -hmm. living our dreams. Passion, passion, passion. Right. Yeah. And until we start reframing um, some of these things as something that you can be passionate about, um, I mean, <clears throat> engineering, for example, has had a really bad uh, – Rap Bad rap for years. a long time, right? Right. Mm -hmm. Oh, so, and you look at TV, and every engineer is homely and weird, and doesn't have a girlfriend, and you know, sits at home and is on their computer all the time. And everyone's been told that they have to be the smartest person in the world. And what have we had for you know the last twenty years? A dearth of engineers. And so, you know, we've been trying to change it as a community, trying to help people understand engineering isn't just about being smart. It's about being creative. It's about problem solving. You're not going to be Sheldon. Maybe you want to be, but, you know, you are you don't have to be Sheldon if you don't want to be. Um, and And that is something that, like, societally we have to change about any of these roles that we want people to go into whether it's engineering or a trades job or, or something like that. But if, if young people don't believe that they're either qualified for the role in the case of engineering, or it's um, something to aspire to in the case of some trades, you know, and how do we convince people that they should aspire to it? And so a lot of it is reframing what, what people should be aspiring to and raising our children to believe that it's okay to do these things. But if you spend all your time telling your kids that the best go big, thing, change the world. Yeah. These kinds of things. Yeah. Or go to university, then they're going to feel like they're failing if they don't. Yeah. It's such an interesting problem in a sense. What do you think would be, do you have any ideas what a good solution is? It's reframe it, but how would you reframe it? Um, and I know clearly we've been struggling with this as a community, but what do you think? I think that's a hard one because I think it, it, it really comes down to what people value, right? Like, do they value stability? Do they value, you know, wealth? Do they value career growth. Um, 
And those are stories you have to tell. But I also think that one of the reasons people have historically not wanted to adopt trade jobs is because they have limited career growth at some point um, and limited wage growth, for example. And this comes back to some of the, the question before, which is, you know, universal basic income, what does it mean to be successful? You know, how do you create, how do you go and reach beyond and and get more? Um, and we don't have great stories there. Hmm. Yeah, so coming up with some sort of good story so that people can, you can just chill and you can do a job um, and it can be a meaningful one that's say a trade or if you want to go really big and you like like it's going to be like i mean you with fetch for example i imagine that was that was a hard path to choose and it was a great like you did very well and everything yeah. is great because of it but it was also probably very difficult yeah i imagine and it was high risk right um, yeah high risk but i i think the other thing that that has changed very much in the last 50 years or 60 years is the disappearance of the pension has also mm. had a very big impact, I think, on trade adoption. I don't... So the pension... Pensions are like you, the the retirement accounts that your company contributes. No, uh, or they, no. So pensions oh. were the last salary that you made in the last year of work, you got 80% of it for the rest of your life. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so why did they disappear? They're expensive. I guess that makes sense. Yeah. Go look up like what happened with GM. Like they had a very large pension program and it almost bankrupted the company. So it's kind of like, um, I don't know, you hear about like, the fall of different countries or something and they eventually are like way over leveraged financially or something to their citizens because of like generous retirement plans like this kind of happened with pensions and so we step back with it but it removes some incentive to go do trade jobs that had good pensions yeah interesting i mean there's a couple yeah. of jobs still left in the world that still get pensions teachers tend to get pensions Yep. Uh, government jobs get pensions, but it used to be that tradespeople got pensions. Uh huh. Would the is the pension the pension is pay, paid by the employer? Yeah. Correct. Yeah. So yeah, that does sound expensive for this kind of thing. And also, it's interesting because like teachers, like I don't know, I have family who uh, are teachers or uh, have been teachers and they're not paid very fairly or right. not, not very much. It's so it's like you give them a pension, but like you're only paying them, I don't know, a third of what they probably should be paid right. at least. Yeah. For it's this very kind complicated. Of thing. So it's like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you get the thing and you get 80% of that, but it's still super, super low. Um, what an interesting thing. I wonder. Um, so back to robots with Digit. So one thing that struck me from looking at Digit, um, in some of the videos, it doesn't really have hands. It has like flippers for where I, w where we have all the fingers mm -hmm. that it can use to pull in and I guess grab things. And then it probably pinches. I don't, I don't remember seeing thumbs. No. Um, Tell me a bit about that choice. Ah, uh, yeah. Um, so that's one instantiation of Digit's hands. <laughs> um, so, yeah, very modular, I suppose. Yeah. You know, when you look at where we're going with the end effectors of Digit, Digit, um, as we evolve the design, we'll have kind of a interchange point like all robots where mm -hmm. we will be able to change out the end effectors of the robot based on the task. Um, it's, it's what industrial robots have been doing for a long time. <clears throat> We've tried to focus on having relatively simplistic grippers to start, or I guess end effectors, I should say, mm -hmm. um, that uh, solve a large swath of problems 
um, with the simplest design. And that's one um, approach that we've taken for doing tote manipulation. And it's fairly robust for some of the, the, the tasks that we've been focused on. But we are right now going to add a different type of gripper to Digit's repertoire uh, for handling totes. Um, So it's, you know, we're trying to create MVP products, right? And so we, we are not trying to solve and swallow all of the complexity at once. Digit mm-hmm. has the ability to have other end effectors. We will make other end effectors for Digit, but our priority is not to make high dexterity hands because honestly, like I haven't seen a problem yet that that we need uh, high dexterity hands for Digit uh, for mm-hmm. the set of use cases that we're tackling right now. Gotcha. So it's just unnecessary complexity yeah. and you can get most of the way there with just very simple, like pinch in grippers kind of thing. Yeah. What do you think? So to me, what it seems is, and this kind of goes back even before you were involved with agility, it seems like it's like the min, as you said, an MVP, it's a minimum product that um, can do something useful and can find market fit and this kind of thing. Um, What do you think of, there's been several companies entering the humanoid space and they seem to be making like full fledged humanoids with not, to my knowledge, they don't have too much of an application in mind for them. And maybe they do. Um, but what are your thoughts on some of the other humanoid robot companies or yeah. humanoid initiatives? Yeah. So if you look at them, some of them are very impressive and have been around for a long time. Like look at Boston Dynamics. Mm -hmm. Um, Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, super impressive. Um, Some of them are stuff. Just bonkers. Yeah. And well, and, and remember they, they started from a very different place, right? They started Mm -hmm. a long time ago as the pet man and they were testing hazmat suits, right? Yeah. And they're hydraulic based. And so they have, Mm -hmm different Super challenges power. yeah um but I, I think that when you look at a lot of the stuff that sprung up recently a lot of it is very startup heavy um they're still even just trying to figure out why they're building it um mm-hmm. many of them haven't declared a market or yep. or shown That's my impression too or shown working robots um i mean let's be honest there's a lot of videos not a lot of reality. Um, And and I'm not trying to criticize. I'm just saying that this is, you know, I went through this in the early days of the AMR market. There was like five companies who were actually building hardware and everyone else was showing really cool videos of hardware Uh and raising money. Right. Um, And, and we're, we're in that stage right now with mobile manipulation robots. Um, Mm. And the thing that I find interesting, though, is is some of the the players that are getting into the game it recently are kind of funny. Um, they're just throwing a lot of money at the problem and just hiring any engineer they can. And they're like, you roboticist, <laughs> you guys are taking too long. It's like, what the hell, man? <laughs> like, we... <Yeah. laughs> As a community, have been working on these problems for a very long time, and like magically, like thinking that you can throw a, a ton of engineers at it and like get good results is, I don't know. It it's a mythical man month, basically, and mm. we'll see. But I I think that there are some really interesting competitors out there. I mm-hmm. you know, and I'm excited about what they're building because, you know, there's plenty of room. I mean, look at what mm-hmm. happened in the AMR market. You know, many there's, companies. Yeah, yeah. There's Locus, Auto, Mir, Fetch. You know, we all did very very well. Um, mm-hmm. So you're thinking of it like. AMRs, I suppose, seeing all these humanoid companies, I was, I was feeling like it was a bit like autonomous vehicles with, um, all the, like 
the the feeling that I'm getting with the investor interest and kind of the hype cycles around it, um, it feels a lot like the early days of autonomous cars in like 2014 or something, when people were like, we're going to have self-driving cars in four years or something like they that. They haven't put enough money in for you to believe it's like autonomous cars yet. It's more like oh, animals. Gotcha. <laughs> yeah, like the total amount of money in mobile manipulation right now and humanoids quote unquote is closer to the amr space still like the total dollars put in from venture how much would that be out of curiosity if you have a good guess um is it like tens of billions or is it it's under five to ten billion that's like that's amrs and then over five to ten billion is uh, automotive over five to ten billion. How much? How much more over? Is it like fifty billion, or is it? I don't know. I don't. I, I. I'm guessing it's in that in that frame range because, like, just look at the. What wasn't there a, like an autonomous car company recently that got some massive, insane amount of money? Um, uh -huh, I don't know. It was like, what was it? Well, um, was it? I thought it was 80, no, 8 billion or something insane like that. That's quite a lot. I wonder which company that was. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, uh, let me see you if can I look can. if you like. Yeah, we have, we have time. Yeah. One of the wonderful things about these long form things, it doesn't really matter. Um, and I'll cut it out if we wait too long. Yeah. I'm trying to find it. Uh... So we couldn't find the company that had the high valuation. But um, so thinking more about humanoids, what do you imagine is a timeline for them? Like, um, so you're going to, you guys are working on them in a logistics and manufacturing space. Um, wh what do you kind of imagine the progression? Like, when will I see one in a grocery store kind of thing? Or like, like when will I see them in my day to day life? Or will it be rele will they be relegated mostly to like, manufacturing and yeah, logistics they're be in warehouses for a while for the next 10 years? Okay, so I mean, but there's a bunch of it seems like there's a lot of excitement where they're like, in two years, there's going to be one in your home. Kind yeah, of thing. okay, Audra, let's reflect. Yes. Okay. In in 2004, <laughs> 2004, they said that everyone will have an autonomous car in 10 years. Oh, man. Oh, man. <laughs> so, uh, now, in 2004, if you derated that and you said autonomous cars would be part of your everyday life, do you feel that's true today? Because I don't. No. Okay. So now today <laughs> we are starting with, with, you know, humanoid bipedal mobile manipulation robots, right? Um, mm -hmm. I don't think that they'll be part of your daily life for another 20 or 30 years. Mm -hmm. I think we'll spend the next 10 years in industrial, light industrial environments there's a lot of safety work that has to be done to get them out of the warehouse and into your house. Mm -hmm. And just, I feel like I have to ask, this doesn't get super accelerated because of LLMs or what are you thinking there? <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, no, because it, it doesn't make the hardware any cheaper. It doesn't make the mm -hmm. controls any easier. It makes the programming of them a little bit easier, but it doesn't make some of the more fundamental problems. Like do LLMs make autonomous cars go faster? No. So why would they make bipedal mm -hmm. navigating robots go any faster either? Yeah. Now thought experiment to just, what if, so if open AI reveals that they have made super intelligent something or another and it's like einstein for every single field all at once how does that work 
Like, does we still have all these hard problems and the timeline kind of stays unchanged? Or what do you think? I think the timeline still changes. It remains unchanged. And maybe that's naive of me, but like, I mean, technology has been constantly progressing, you know? And Mm -hmm. although ChatGPT is super interesting and showing very interesting progress, how much has it fundamentally changed your day to day in the last (laughs) 12 months? It's a better Google to me, is what it's been. it's, It's not, I mean, Yes, people are very excited about it. It's very powerful in very specific ways, but it's not the, um, you know, uh, singularity moment that that everyone. It's nowhere near that, right? It's it's like you said, it's a fancier Google right now, um, mm-hmm. and I I think though that like, um, you know, uh some of the thoughts that Bill Gates put Bill Gates put out about like personalized agents is kind of interesting. Um, but there's a lot of what other said. things that we have to, to deal with around. Like what if, what if you had your own chat GPT? Hmm. Like that, that had a history uh, and this kind of thing. That, no, that was like, it took all of your data, all of it. It has everything about you, your medical yeah. records, Everything, everything you ever wrote, everything you ever did, all of it, Mm -hmm. and was like your own personal agent, and could be your the business version of you and your home version of you, and Mm -hmm. did all of these things and could manage the complexities of your life. Super cool, right? Like Mm -hmm. that's probably the next thing that might happen with this kind of technology. That would be super cool. Yeah, but there's so many problems we have to figure out. In order for someone like me and potentially you to even want to give it all of our data, and then what do what do we do when people want to advertise to us with that data? Mm. And how do we set our own boundaries? And how do we deal with the complex social interactions that come out of that? Like, okay, so you and I have personal assistants that are these mm-hmm. agents, right? Yeah. And you you say you say to your agent, hey, see if Melanie wants to have dinner, okay? And my agent is like, well, Melanie's already got plans with friends that we are both friends with. Hmm. But, oh, yeah, yeah. But you weren't invited, right? And so <laughs> do you want my <laughs> agent to go to your agent and be like, well, uh, you know, and so how do you even keep secrets between agents? How do you define that? How do we uh. like, and so I think it's a super interesting space, but I think there's a lot of social fallout that we haven't thought about. And it's the same with all of HRI, right? Like Mm -hmm. there's all this contextualized social interaction and it's not just, you know, in quotes, social interaction. It's, it's highly contextualized to our, you know, region, our, our cultural backgrounds, things like that. And I don't know if we're ready or we're like, we're at that mm. point where the technology has that sophistication yet. Mm, that's a good point. Yeah, I guess, yeah, there's a whole bunch of things that need to be worked out and you really have to see how people react. So this kind of thing can't really be rushed, I would imagine. Well, I mean, they'll always be the people at the forefront and they'll be yep. learning all the painful lessons. Yep. Yeah, that distribution of like the early adopters yeah. and this kind of thing. What do you... Um, so? One thing that's been interesting to me, um, there's, again, from a recent space, we had someone come on that's like just about to graduate with a degree mm-hmm. in computer science where mm-hmm. they um, feel like it's a hard, like, I think the feeling is because of things like ChatGPT that there's no reason to go into something like computer science because you're just going to get in a thing and be automated right away for this kind of thing. I think that's the feeling. I wanted to hear your thoughts on it. Like, do you think it's a good time to be a roboticist? Absolutely. uh, I think it's a great time (laughs) to be a roboticist. This is the, probably the next 50 years are going to be like the heyday of robotics, like of, of mobile robotics, mobile, mobile manipulation robotics. Mm -hmm. I think from 1960 to 2000 was probably the heyday of, industrial robotic arms 2000 
to 2015 was probably the heyday of collaborative robotic arms. Um, mm. You know, 2014 till now and going forward is the heyday of autonomous mobile robots. You know, I, I think mm. that 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 now is the time. I mean, I think that Willow Garage really kicks something off and we're like, we're in it. And so, yeah, you should definitely become a roboticist. It's our Hell time. Yeah. That's my feeling too. I have a feeling that it is probably the best time yeah. so far to be a roboticist. What do you, so for someone who's feeling lost, especially with all the advancing technology, what advice do you have for them? Like how, how do they, how do they get a foothold in this world? And I don't know, how do they do well? Learn to what? Yeah. Learn to program, learn Ross. Hell yeah. The, the thing that I was thinking, it's, um, it's almost like everyone gets a bunch of junior programmers beneath them, um, for working. And it's like with ChatGPT, you get an assistant for this Mm -hmm. kind of thing. It's like everyone is kind of their own CEO. Uh, and you have a bunch of people to delegate to that are all AIs. Yeah, um, is how I've been thinking of it a bit. Because it's not so much like you still have a lot of autonomy in how you choose to move forward, and you don't have to do a lot of the grunt work um, from these things. And like, a, I mean, I'm I'm using Angular, which is a complex web framework made by Google in work for Intrinsic, and. Um, I am up and running super fast because of chat GPT. It's like, that's a, that's a real power there. Yeah. And I I think the other thing is, is I don't know what your early career space was like as an engineer, but there, there was this time early in my career with, where I was always afraid to ask a question, Hmm. you know, and like go bother someone who knew more than me. And now you don't have to, you can, bother chat GPT, Ah, you know, like, (laughs) so your ability to ask questions and to fail, you know, or, or ask dumb questions is totally enabled by having this knowledge consolidator. Yeah. I think that's a good point. I do think there's a, an interesting case there where it's actually not very good at answering questions about the bleeding edge of things. And so it's very good at answering everything that's kind of in the like very well-known space. But, um, I wonder, I feel like that's something to be a little wary of where if you're like, I don't know, how, how do I do this super hard thing? And it gives you a super generic answer, like talking to you or someone who's like actually done very hard things is going to be so much more informative than just asking these same questions to chat GPT. Sure, sure, but that's when you're in the mid cycle of your career. I was speaking oh, more to like super the early. early stages of your career. You just got out of university and you're struggling with something that you know you feel like would be almost wasting your mentor's time, right? Mm. Yes, that is a very good point. Yeah, you could just bug Chat GPT. Yeah, what an interesting thing. So we are coming to the end of the time. One of the things that I wanted to ask about, um, and we've just been talking about other things, but, um, so so agility was doing Amazon trials, um, with their robots. Yeah. How how did that go? And tell me a bit about that. It's great. We, you know, there were a whole bunch of, uh, news media articles put out. There's a bunch of videos. It's going really well. Um, so we've been working with Amazon for quite a while. Uh, in in some different applications uh you saw one of the applications in some of the videos that were highlighted um, as part of their demo day and now we're moving on to some other phases of the project which are really exciting Um, and we're continuing to work with them on on these projects and excited to start deploying more robots with them Mm -hmm. yeah that's so cool are they um how does it, I suppose you have other customers too, but they're one of the big ones and they're one of the, like, I mean, you said they have 750,000 robots, if I remember Kiva correctly, robots, like yeah. Kiva robots, which is bonkers. So, I mean, there's clearly lots of potential to yeah. scale. Yeah. 
Um, I think that's really awesome. But you're you're also working with other companies. Yes, we are too. Hell yeah, yeah. and all very same similar use case yes. at the moment, which is yeah. picking up those totes. Yep. Okay, super cool. I'm glad that's going well. It's so yeah. cool. Um, I I really it's exciting to see a humanoid robot that's doing a really practical job yeah. in a sense and making a lot of sense for the ROI of these, like justifying itself with a good return on investment for the companies that are investing in it. Cause I think that was my big skepticism for the space was I think it'd be hard to get a good ROI for a lot of the more complex yeah. ones, at least yeah. initially. Yeah. But customers wouldn't, be working with us if they didn't believe that there was a return on investment hell yeah let's see so what um what do you think is the future like tell me the next two five years for agility where are you guys headed yeah so over the next couple of years we're going to be very focused on expanding our let's call it skill set so you know as i was telling you we look at Digit as a platform that has composable skills. Um, and as we start working with more and more customers, we're going to be expanding the set of skills that Digit has. So that would be in the areas of, you know, tote manipulation, but also tote stacking, de-stacking, um, tote, <laughs> tote wrangling, those types <laughs> of things. But then also moving into other types of containers like corrugate boxes, palletization, depalletization. And so it's mm. just looking at the the space of, of activities in the warehouse and slowly branching out across a swath of similar activities within the warehouse. So there's a lot of processes that require taking some kind of container, whether it's mm -hmm. a tote or a box, um, from a shelf or to a shelf, from a conveyor or to a conveyor, uh, from a cart or to a cart. <laughs> um, yeah. And so now you've got all these skills. It's like, okay. And then now if you know how to take something to and from a conveyor and to and from a shelf and to and from a cart, now you can go from a shelf to a conveyor, from a conveyor mm -hmm. to a cart, right? And so we look at it as a building up of a composable skill space that then eventually can be deployed into different applications. And eventually Digit has all the skills to form the basis for an app store for labor. And then you mm. start looking at the, the workflows and the tasks that Digit can do and, you know, building out the next thing based on the mm. skill set that Digit already has. And so as you start gathering all these skills, it's like any person, the more skills you can do, the more jobs you can do. Mm. I like that. Yeah, it's a it's a cool thing. You keep building the capabilities that keeps opening up applications that keeps letting you grow your market. And then it's just it's like a nice flywheel in a sense. Yeah. And you said App Store at yeah. some point like that. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's so interesting that App Stores are um, like, it's kind of, I, I guess, Maybe we're we'll like call it a skill phone. store. Fine, skill store. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> skill store. But it's just it's so interesting because I, in a lot of these interviews, I talk with them, and then it's like the long term vision is to get to something like a, an app store or a skill store for this kind of thing, and it makes a lot of sense because then you have the diversity of application that um, like it becomes generally useful. Do do you think that? Um, Humanoid robots are going to become like, will they be like the silly metaphor, but will they be like the spreadsheet of the computer age where it's like you have something flexible enough that it justifies things, places getting one. And then mm -hmm. from that, like you get it, it does its core application and now a bunch of people are buying it, but then you can also add other programs on it um, that also provide some value, like spreadsheets justifying computers. Yeah. I, I think so. I think I think the thing is, is in the industrial landscape, it's harder to do that because um, the primary motivator for return on investment is a is like the primary work task. Mm -hmm. um, but I think when you look at like, um, oh, if you look at like, good point. 
uh, retail applications or storefront applications, you know, uh, forgoing the fact that Pepper had limited utility because it had limited utility. Um, yeah. If Pepper was a fully capable humanoid <laughs> robot, like you could believe then, yeah, then you would have kind of Pepper's primary activity, but there was probably a whole bunch of other things that Pepper could have done mm-hmm. where LLMs, ironically enough, would be perfect. Yeah, like, for sure. Like imagine walking into a retail store and saying, hey, Pepper, can you help me find a pink blouse? Or, you know, then that becomes very interesting in that space. But I think when the return on investment in the industrial application is very, you know, task oriented as opposed to like a retail or a grocery uh, space or a um, hardware store, for example, you know, like have you ever tried to find someone to help you find the screw you're looking for at Home Depot or all Lowe's? the time? It's, yeah. It's like searching for a needle in a haystack. And then they're walking somewhere. Now you're following them. Yeah. This kind of thing. Yeah, for sure. And so, but imagine if, if the utility of those types of robots is, is more of what we're talking about, where maybe the, the original application that you maybe have is uh, restocking for the robot, but when it's not mm-hmm. restocking, an individual can walk up to it and ask it to find a screw. Yeah. Or even while it's restocking, just like yeah. the people that are working there. Okay. Very interesting. Um, do you... Let's see, like, I guess wrapping up, um, what are you excited about in robotics now in general? Hmm. What am I excited about in robotics? I don't know. Hmm. (laughs) Um, I, I think I'm, I think I'm most excited maybe about, uh, the, the growing interest in making robots usable. Um, (laughs) And, right. and I, I, um, I think that that's, that's something that's still going to take us a long time as a community, but I'm, I'm very, um, excited by the progress we're making there. I, I somewhat wish there was like, um, an academic version of an, in, or in, industrial conference that was more like an academic conference where like companies could go and just present their HRI work. Um, Mm, I think it would be very interesting because one of the things that you, when, when you look out into the, or the usability work for robotics is there aren't a lot of places for us to talk about it as a community. And, and a lot of the research has limited data sets that are limited to, to like university students or whatever users they could scrounge up on a, Sunday, um, yeah. as opposed to some of the companies that have, you know, thousands Huge. of hours of interactions with hundreds of people at a time, mm-hmm. kind of data sets. Um, and, and I'd really, I, I wish that we had more of a community and an opportunity to talk about and a venue for talking about kind of how do we advance usability for robotics? Mm-hmm. Why do you think someone's not doing that? Or is it a new idea? Because I think it seems like a great idea. Um, Probably some of it is proprietary work. Like, I will admit that I had a very strong interest in it, but Fetch never showed any of its UI ever. It like, mm. like there's very few videos of it online. Yeah. Gotcha. Everyone's holding their cards close to their chest for that kind of thing. Yeah. Okay. Well... Uh, do you have any links or contact info you'd like to share with our watchers and listeners? Um, I don't know. I'm on Twitter, tw- Twitter or X, whatever it's called these days. And, uh, at Melanie wise, I mean, all my handles are Melanie wise. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Hell yeah. And I'll put a link to agility in yeah, the episode. Yeah. Hell yeah. Okay. Well, it's been great talking to you and hearing your opinion on a lot of things. Uh, it's an awesome cool. perspective and I'm, I really value it. Awesome. Well, uh, it's nice seeing you and hopefully we'll grab a beer sometime. Hope so. All right. See ya. Bye. That's it. 
I, for one, had my opinions changed on humanoids from this interview, but what did you think? Do you agree with Melanie that we're not going to see humanoids outside of manufacturing and logistics for 10 years or so? What other low-hanging fruit might humanoids be used for? If you're not already, consider subscribing to never miss an interview, and I'll see you next time.